of God in their life, and he's a a brother, a deacon, uh, many other roles he has in this church family. But um, basically, we go through this each time of where did God find you, and then what was that moment or that time when he did find you, and then what's happened since. So that's the first question I have for you is, little Tori Vesco growing up, what was your life like and, and uh, leading you toward that time, find or him finding you? All right, so some of you, am I on? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Some of you guys know a little bit about my story. Um, I grew up, my mom and dad separated when I was really young. Um, when I was about three, three and a half years old, my sister and I were at the house. Dad was at work. We lived in Martinsburg between the two silos. Anybody that's ever kind of been in that area, we were back behind there. Um, my mom was at home with my sister and I, and she decided she was done, and she left. And so she locked us in the house. I, rem- I don't have too many recollections of my childhood before then. I just remember that moment. I guess it's kind of one of those events that kind of discipled and discerned who I was going to be growing up. But I remember my sister and I, we were just wearing our diapers, weren't wearing anything else. I don't remember the events that came the rest of that day. I don't remember the years, that, the couple years that followed after that. But I remember that was the last day I saw my mom, I think, until, she was, until I was eight. Um, so my dad came home. My dad raised us. My dad was a Christian, but he wasn't living a Christian heart at that time. So Christ really wasn't a part of our lives. When I was about five, my dad met a lady who I call mom now, um, my stepmom. And she made a huge impact and brought Christ into our family life. And so one thing I thought about, something that I haven't shared in the past, is that I have two grandparents that molded me in a lot of ways. I have a Grandma Bass, who is my stepmom's mom. If you've ever had a chance to be around the family, Christ has been the center of her life. They went to Hannibal LaGrange before I did. Um, they, they've always impacted our, our life since they came in our, into our family. As Christ always been a center point, but she is your Baptist, you know, kind of person. She kind of lives that same lifestyle. And then I had my dad's mom, who even when my dad was going through all of his stuff, my dad's mom was a smoker and kind of a wild, real rusty, real rough and aggressive type lady. Um, but she preached Christ from the, even when I was young. I do remember that. Um, I had some traumatic experiences when I was young. I remember my dad worked a lot before. Lana came into our, my mom came into our lives, and I remember staying with my grandpa and my grandma. Um, My grandpa was an alcoholic, um, drank all the time, but most of the time I didn't see that because he drank after we left because we stayed with him pretty much all day long. Um, And I remember one time my dad got called in. He did heating and air conditioning, so he had to go in in the evening, um, and I had to go back and stay with my grandma and my grandpa. Well, my grandpa had been drinking and smoking and some different things, and I don't remember how the situation happened, but I remember he grabbed me by my hair and pulled me down the, high, or down the hallway, took me in the back bedroom, and tried to light me on fire. Um, this is the guy that, I, that was the most impactful person in my life up to that, to that time. Is the guy I spent most of my time with because my grandparents pretty much raised us. His dad worked all the time. Um, my grandpa was not saved at that time. My dad came home. I don't recall a whole lot other than I've never seen my dad mad. I remember my dad went off, and he put us in the car, and... All I know is from that moment on, my grandpa got saved. He never drank again. Um, So he passed away a few years later, but I know that he's in heaven today. Um, But I had two grandparents that always, two grandmas that always pushed Christ in our lives and everything that we did. I was about, I was either eight or I was nine. We were going to Centennial Baptist Church in Mexico, Missouri. I remember one Sunday, it was about a month before Easter, um, pastor was talking about if you don't know Christ, then you're going to go to hell. And he gave this big explanation of what hell was going to be like and what the experience could be, and it scared me to death. I, I remember having a nightmare, and I don't remember the nightmare. I remember the only other nightmare I had at a young age was when I watched The Thing, and it scared me to death, and I couldn't sleep. Well, I had a similar type nightmare to that. Um, and so that Sunday, whenever he shared that, I came forward at the end of service. I found out later that he didn't give a call to the front. He was just closing service, but I came anyway. And so he changed it to kind of go with what was going on with me. Um, and I remember the expression he used as, you know, we're a coffee mug as people. And he's like, we're full with all this darkness, which is coffee. And when Christ comes in, he washed, he poured water and he washed it all out, how we come clean. And 
if that's something that I'd be interested in. I said I was. And so I have been blessed, though, because for the last 31 years of my life, I've lived a life with Christ as a center point. Um, and so I've spent a majority of my life with Christ and very small amount of my life without Christ. So. And what's your heart's desire from that and now? What is your heart's desire when it comes to your walk with the Lord? Um, as we grew up, my dad was always trying to get us to serve in the areas that, that we're passionate about. You kind of pushed a lot of the same things. Um, this community is my passion. Where I live, my family, um, whether it's through the sports ministry that we do here with the basketball ministry or it's through the recreational softball league or it's through my job. Um, I work in a community where my job is to help better the families that live within the Warren County community. Some of you guys have worked at Youth in Need in the past and you kind of know some of the things that we do. I know Mr. Ben works there now. Um, My biggest thing is that I don't want to ever walk out of the house without praying that God kind of guides everything that goes on with me. I pray for my family. I pray for my wife. I pray for this church. I pray for my finances. I pray that every morning before I leave that I do my job to honor God, not my supervisor per se. Um, It's just to keep that as a focal point of my life. Um, I've been truly blessed for the last 31 years to know that in all decisions Christ has been a part of. I've had some major experiences with those. Um, I had been praying for years for us to be promoted in my previous job than this one. Um, and it didn't happen as quick as I wanted, even though everybody said I was really good at what I did. God finally opened the door, and he put me in a job that I didn't like in a promotion. But that job was only put there to close the door. You know, I was really comfortable in what I was doing. Things were pretty easy for me in my last job, and God had to take me out of that comfort zone and put me in a position that I didn't quite like. I'm not a management person. I realized that pretty quick. Um, I like to be in the field. And so I got in that job, and my, all of a sudden my heart wasn't in anymore, and I started praying for God to open something else. And I went to bed one night with a, you know, we had a couple kids violent. We had a kid throw a chair through a, supposed to be a bulletproof window. You're working at a juvenile yeah, center at, at, at that Yeah, at point. a juvenile center. I was working with guys that committed um, adult crimes, murder and rape. Um, I was a therapist for 10 years in that setting and a supervisor, and then, For the last 10 months, I was a manager. Um, And God has always protected me in that job. Um, I had situations where I had a 300-pound guy that was knocking everybody out in the room but wouldn't swing on me. You know, God has always protected me in those type of situations. We've been in situations in the gym where guys are about to go down, and I jump in, and it's not me. I don't ever do anything where I'm protected because I don't ever know what's going to happen, but I do feel like God has always protected me. But in that situation, I didn't feel safe anymore. I didn't feel comfortable. And God, I felt like, was leading me, hey, if you trust me, if you step out of this, I got something better for you that's, it's just different. And so this youth in need job that I interviewed, I thought I was going to be helping juveniles again. I didn't realize I was teaching little kids and families the importance of being involved in their kids' lives and making an impact in their kids' life at a young age and how important that is. Um, So I quit that job. That position became available the day after I quit, and I got hired. I got two weeks vacation to find another job. I got hired two weeks and one day later. I started two weeks and one day later. So it just kind of. Yeah, it's the it's work of God. Well, I want to pray thanking the Lord for you and your life and your family and, and just your story and his grace. But then I'll have you read scripture if you would, please. Father, I thank you for my brother, our brother, Tori. I thank you for how you did a work. You reached into a home. And you do that, God. You do that. And all of our stories are you reached into it could be the cleanest home but we're still dirty with sin. And so thank you for doing what you did in Tori's life. And we ask you to continue blessing him and his family and his community and and uh, that you use him in a mighty way. And I ask you that if there's somebody sitting here and they even think about Uh, where they're at and um, man I've just gone this far for so long well so did Tori's grandpa and you stepped into his life and you changed his life you are in the business of changing lives God help us to never forget that and make us aware of the of your grace and your willingness to impact not just uh, for heaven but for now because this testimony didn't just 
talk about uh, the sweet by and by. It talked about the fact that there are people with real problems, real issues, and you reached in and did it. And even in Tori's life, by providing him with the wife you did and the kids you did and, and uh, the job you did. Thank you, God. It's your grace that it's poured out. And we're, we're blessed because of it. It's in, and it's in Jesus' name. All right, the reading today is in Mark chapter 10, verses 28 through 31, and it's on page 846 in your pew Bible. I also just realized this is probably the first time my biggest girls ever heard the story about some of the stuff that went on, so we'll talk later, sweetie. (laughs) All right, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I say to you. There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. If you noticed on the communion table, the the game of Monopoly, all right? I don't know if you've ever been with people that when they play a game in the house that you've set up and you've started, they need to have this available, all right? I've told you before, my sister, this is my sister. She wants, before we have a game, she wants that pulled out and she wants to understand the letter of the law, okay? Let me help you out with Monopoly for a moment. These are, these are these practical moments in our lives. Do you know what the object of Monopoly is, according to the rules? Listen to this. The object of the game is to become the wealthiest player through buying, renting, and selling property. That's it. And that sometimes is the American dream. That's the thing that people say is the goal, is, um, boy, if, the, if we could do that, then we've succeeded. That's success. But it is interesting how this plays out. I, I don't know if you've ever had, I've had arguments in the midst of this game. I've played this game with people that have taken it and put their fingers underneath and lifted it very quickly. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever played with people like that. I have. I, I can gladly say I haven't been that person. Okay, I've done it this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> but... But it is interesting when you play with different people and the rules that are played with concerning this. One of the rules that we had growing up was this. If somebody lands on your property and they don't notice, nobody can tell them. But have you ever had that person that lives for your pain? That literally, even after you say it, you know, Hey, you just, or they nudge them, or they make a noise or something. Hey, you know what I know? And literally, when they land, I'm grabbing that dice up, and I'm trying to roll, because once that roll is done, they can't say anything. But you've got those guys. And by the way, I've never seen that in the rule book. <laughs> Another rule that we had, a house rule that we had, was on free parking, we made it so that everything that was paid went into the middle. Okay? But then you find out, no, no, that's not how it's played out. It's just stuff that comes off of chance and community chest that's thrown in the middle. Did you know, actually, here's the rule. Listen to this. Free parking. A player landing on this place does not receive any money, property, or reward of any kind. This is just a free resting place. Huh. I've never heard that until I looked at the rules. Now I've ruined this for so many of you. You're like, no, we'll keep going with my thing. All right. Why? 
because that's house rules. And I could keep going on, but you guys want to get to the Bible. No, you hate me talking about this stuff. You want, Give us Bible. I'm here. All right. So we will. So think about that for a moment. In our lives, so many of the times we would love for this game that we're playing, we know it's not a game, but this thing that we're doing, to have these rules. And what happens often is we make the rules as we go. Certain experiences that we have, certain things that have affected our lives, I talk about it as our backpack. Like, I see Tori's love for his girls and his family. I think, and I'm not going to psychoanalyze him too much because he, could, he can take out a 300-pound guy, so I'm getting close to that. Um, why are they laughing? Because it's somewhat true. Um, that because of what he experienced... In his mind, he could go one of two, I mean, a lot of different ways, but one way is that he could do what was done to him, or he could go, I will never allow that to be in my life. And so it's a value that he has because of the backpack, and it's his house rule. And we could go around to each of you, different things you experience. I talked with Bob, who grew up, he, called, he says, I was a street kid. Raised by the Salvation Army. So why are certain things dear to him? It's because of what he went through with that. And I, if I spent enough time with you and start, oh, that's why that's important to you. That's why you look at life that way. And some of that is fine. If it lines up with the ultimate rule book of this thing called life. If I pick stuff as stuff that I put ultimate value in, each of those things are good things, but if I put on my ultimate value based on my experiences and not, and then I read scripture and I go, oh, actually God's diametrically opposed to that thing, but I value that thing because of what I experienced. And he goes, I want you to trust me in this that what I'm saying here is true, I have to have my rules re-engineered back to this. And that's what I believe church is about. That's what I believe Sunday school is about, Bible study is about, time in, in focus on the revelation of God, that it, by illumination, he would go, he would make you aware and me aware of, oh, I've been heading and for years I've been doing house rules on something that I'm, I seem to be comfortable, it seems to work, but I have to come back to, but what has he said? Because there is a way, the Bible says in Proverbs, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. So I have to, I have to look at my experiences, and if it's a good thing, that's, that's fantastic. But when I come face to face with this thing and go, oh, I've actually been doing this wrong all this time. God, would you help me by faith to trust you? Because it is such a natural thing for me to slide into this old shoe that's so comfortable, and maybe you're going, actually, I've got, some, I've got an insert for you that's the best thing for your foot and your walk. So I want to pray again, and then I want to spend this time in the Word with you. So let's pray. Father, I ask you that as we're looking at this story, that we'd, that we'd get it, that we'd have an understanding of what you're trying to teach us here. Would you... Would you make us aware of that? And maybe if there's some realigning that we need to do, that, God, we'd be obedient to that. And I don't know how that plays out for each and everybody here. Thank you that you look at us um, as your children, if we are your children. We, we look at us as your children, and, and you call us to something more than just comfort. You call us to um, the ultimate life. And we thank you for the abundant life that is in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, point number one, if you want to take notes, there's a section in your bulletin. You can pull that out. It, the point, first one is it's in the asking. It's in the asking. Uh, look at verse 28 of Mark 10. Peter began to s say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Now, 
stop and think about context again. That's an important thing to, whenever you're looking at the word uh, to understand what is, what is the, the context of what he's trying to say. Do you remember what just happened in the story? We talked about it last week. There was, uh, Jesus talked to them about greatness, and he talked about children and things like that. And after he did that, because his, his disciples were a little upset with him, um, or upset with these uh, parents bringing children, he goes, no, don't, don't stop these kids from coming to me. This is what the kingdom looks like. This is what greatness looks like. And so after that's done, he starts to walk, and this rich young ruler starts running after him. And he says, he stops him, Rabbi, what must I do to uh, have eternal life? He says, good rabbi, what must a good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus goes through these steps of the law. And so this, this man has an understanding in his mind, because that's what the law should do. It should make us aware of our sinfulness. And he says, you know what the law says. Do not do this, do not do this, do not do this. And then he said, I've done, the, the rich young ruler goes, I've done all of that ever since I was little. And he goes, one thing. And he went for the guy's jugular vein. He goes, um, what you have, sell, give to the poor, and follow me. And the guy walked away because he was really, 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 really rich. And his thing was idolatry. That was his thing, and he wasn't willing to give that up. That was the point. It wasn't if, if, if a guy that had sex issues was going on, uh, running up to Jesus and say, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He would, Jesus could have gone through all the other laws, and he said, I've done that ever since I was little. And he says, well, thou shalt not commit adultery even in your mind. And he'd walk away, because that was his thing. But this guy's thing was um, wealth and, and uh, idolatry and things like that. And he wasn't willing to give up his idol for Jesus. And then Jesus talks to them about um, what the idea is, because who, who, the disciples goes, who's gonna, who can be saved? And he goes, well, what's impossible with man is possible with God. This is when Peter raises his hand and he says, verse 28, see, we have left everything and followed you. So the context is this. That guy didn't leave all of his stuff to follow you. We have. We get it, Jesus. And so we have him here saying, we have left everything. We have followed you. Do, are we doing good? And is it worth it? Or what's in it for us? Is anything going to happen because we've sacrificed like this? And by the way, uh, Peter still had a house. Still had a boat, even. I know you're like, well, man, he's really rich. He's got a boat, you know. Um, because later we find him in the last chapter of uh, John. He's back to fishing again. And so they've left everything. But the point on leaving everything is this, is when nothing we have is a roadblock to following Christ. Christians can still have stuff. You do realize that even in the book of Acts, when people said, oh, they came and brought all they had, or they, he was talking about because they had to meet in homes, and so there were Christians that still had homes that they would meet in. It's not this, I've got to get rid of everything. Now I love God. No. Is there anything, the, the old hymn says, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Okay. So is everything cleared out so that if at, at any point God could, you, or is there something in between you and God that keeps you from being willing to do whatever he asks. That's what he's talking about. Point number two, it's in the answering. It's in the answering. Look at verse 29. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel. So true, truly is, this is dogmatic truth. When Jesus says truly before, sometimes, sometimes he even says truly, truly, or in the old King James, verily, verily, okay? It's, you got to hear me on this one. It's the, it's the Charles Stanley listen. It's the, it's the one where I, I want you to have an understanding that you got to hear me on this one. Truly, 
dogmatic truth. No one, not, this is not a double negative, anyone that does this will be, cons- will be compensated. Nothing we give up compares to what we get in this deal. And so he starts listing these things. And if you think about it, there's some pretty good stuff here. A house is a form of security. I mean, isn't it? It's nice to have a house. A family, at least it's supposed to, that's security too. That's a, that's a good thing. And then he starts listing. He goes, brothers, sisters, mother, father. He's really emphasizing something that they have an understanding that's like, yeah, these things, these are important things he's talking about. Children, lands, all of these bring a sense of security. But ultimately, my security has to be in God. Has to be in God. All those things are fantastic, and God does not discount that. Jesus does not discount that. He's saying these things are good things, but I just want you to know, if that had to happen, that I see that. And by the way, God wants families together. He's all about it. He wants he wants marriages to be what they are. He wants moms and children and dads and children. They want people to get along. But in some situation, you think about in other countries what they're dealing with. When somebody steps out in the waters of baptism or somebody steps out and says, I'm a Christian, what can happen with that? It's brutal. We're so blessed in this country, but it's brutal for the people that step out. And so he's saying, are you willing to do that for me? Look what he says. Verse 30. Who will not receive a hundredfold. Now look at this. Now in this time. Just stop and think about that. This isn't just sweet by and by. This isn't just, boy, I'm, I'm investing in these people and someday in heaven there will be a reward. In this time who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Oh, think about that. That sounds like, yeah, I don't know if you knew, there's a thing called prosperity gospel. If you do this, God's going to give you this. He's going to make you healthy and wealthy and wise, and you're just going to have all this stuff. Man, I read my Bible, and I don't see a lot of that. But when I look at that verse, and by the way, prosperity gospel guys love this verse. And they really ride this verse. But I want, we want to get to what is he really saying here. So, who will not receive a hundredfold, now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. And I think what this is saying is, when we do this thing called the Christian life, and I'm all in, Here's what happens. I get blessed the blessing of you. I'm going to share something with you. you might, I don't know what you're going to think about it. Your house? Kind of my house, too. Like, I'm not showing up at the, you know, hey, just so you know, I was going to look in your fridge, see how things are going, you know. My wine's kind of empty, you know. But is, isn't there a beauty in the church with one another? I was watching this play out just yesterday at a wedding and how families come alongside one another and help each other out. And they don't do it a lot. They don't do it like, and and you better do this. You're doing it. And what ends up happening out of it is, and then that family helps this family. And it just plays out all over the place. And, And I've got a bunch of sisters here. I got a bunch of brothers here. I got a bunch of Mothers and fathers and people that will be willing to pour into my life and the life of my kids and grandkids. And it just plays out that way. A hundredfold. And so when, but if we want to make it about, but man, I got to have, I should have a hundred houses. Well, that's kind of selfish. But if I meet you, you've shown, you've showed up. And this is the beauty of the gospel. And it plays out. In such a beautiful way. That's amazing. That's 
his heart's desire for us. And that we would look at it instead of going, I've got this stuff and I'm going to hold on to this as opposed to, I'm going to let go. And see how God uses that. But I want you to look at a verse that comes up in this verse, uh, a word that comes up in this verse that is put in there and you're like, but why did you have to put that one in there? Look at the next word here, next word. He says, who will not receive a hundredfold, and then he lists all, and then he goes, with persecutions. Now, can you guess? With persecutions? Seriously? And yet, by the prosperity gospel guys, they jump that one. They just jump it or erase it or white out it. It's there. There will be also hard stuff. Difficult stuff. Because in the midst of that, you also have people. I mean, you've heard it before. Ministry would be a great thing if it weren't for people. All right? But that's the reality is we, we're people. We're sinners. We mess up. And a line I heard within the past year and a half that is so true, there is no hurt like church hurt. Let me repeat it. There is no hurt like church hurt. There will be times, even in the midst of, because we're sinners, but we're saved by grace, that you will have things happen with people that you never thought it would happen. And they, and they don't mean, and here's why. Here's what's interesting about it. The moment that you start getting all cocky about it is you could be that person too. You don't want to be, sometimes, but sometimes I know I, I have hurt people because I found out later I hurt them. And I didn't mean to. But have an understanding that on this thing called family, because I don't know if you've ever had this, has your family ever hurt you? And if they haven't, wow. But here's why these things hurt. We've talked about this just recently. A stranger does something that bugs you. It can bug you. It can bug you all the way in the line at the store or in the car. And it can bug you for a little while. It could even bug you for the rest of the day. But at a certain point, you go, I don't even care. That's that guy. I don't know him. But somebody you know does something. You can carry that for a real long time. Why? Because you love them. You care. There's times where you'd stop and go, man, I can't believe that happened. But it happened. And um, I found out later, there's been times where I found out, I've had pastor friends that found out, I have one recently that was talking to me. He did something. He didn't mean to do it at all. And a year later, somebody finally, and this person just vented to him. And he found out a year ago, he had said something to this guy's daughter. And he got, and those people were nice to him in church. They did stuff, and it never was dealt with. And he just found out because this guy finally went off on him. And he didn't know. And I could do that to you. And you could do that to me. And I'm just picking that. That's not really when you think about it. That's not persecution. But God is trying to get our attention and say, hey, just so you know, Jesus, Jesus says to Peter, because Peter goes, are, are, is this worth it, what we're doing? And he goes, I just want you to know, you're going to get back a hundredfold. But in the midst of that, there's going to be sometimes hard stuff and hurtful stuff. And I'm telling you ahead of time. So that later you go, you said a hundredfold, and you, but you didn't tell. I, did, I actually told you. It's the last word. You may not have heard it. Persecutions. And so be prepared for that. And then also understand that sometimes people don't even, they didn't mean to hurt you. Sometimes they do. There's interesting people. But sometimes people don't mean to hurt you. Forgive. Let go. says with persecution so we have it in this time and in the age to come eternal life so i want you to know that it's we get the blessings now and we also get them in eternity there is a heaven folks there's a hell but there's a heaven and there is something to look forward to and i'm so grateful to god
a lot of times there's, there seems to be an emphasis today pushing away from prophecy. Something you really? Yeah, trust me, there's a big push against prophecy. And even the afterlife, talking about the afterlife, whether it be heaven or hell, let's just talk about re- right now. You know what? All of it needs to be talked about. We need, need to all, always remember that there is a hell. There's a reality of hell. You look at, there's a, there's a young man that gave testimony today that hearing about the reality of hell made him go, I don't want to go there. And that's not a bad thing to go, I don't want to go there because it's bad. And to say, I want a heavenly home with my Savior. You'll meet also, there will be people that would say, hey, I don't want my motivation to be rewards. I don't want my motivation to be rewards. You notice that when Peter brings that up, Jesus does not say to him, you know, I don't like the fact that you want to be motivated by rewards. He doesn't say that. He goes, you give up, I'm telling you, you will get benefits. And Jesus does talk about rewards. There's nothing wrong with that. We do it with everything else. That doesn't mean it's necessarily right, but it makes sense to us. I know, I could be wrong, but some of you are investing in your children. Why do you do that? I would think there's a part of you that goes, down the road, I want this functioning human being that will ultimately do this and this and this. You don't go, eh, you know, they're all right. I'll feed them. Maybe, you know. It's you think about these things. Why? Because you would love dividends down the road. It's, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with those expectations. And I think there's, there's a pureness in these motives to say, boy, I want to follow Christ. Well, I'm going to invest in what is good, what has value. Last point, point number three. It's in the affirming. It's in the affirming. Verse 31. But many who are first will be last. And the last, first. This is that, that topsy-turvy um, t- time where when certain things are like, it's just counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, what you're saying is, you're saying that the, the first will be last, last will be first. That's what I'm saying. And, um, well, I like how he puts it here in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. He's talking about how we invest, what we put in. He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So what are you investing in? What has ultimate value to you? What are you willing to say, this is the thing? And you think about rocks, because he used the, the example of rocks. That's one rock, one stone. Okay. Do you know how many um, hours there are in a week? Quickly, some of you are like, oh yeah, I know. 24 times 7 is 168. Okay. Pastor Jason and Sarah were at a conference in Dallas called the D6 Conference. It was a family ministry conference, and they came back with this illustration that just hit me. It was was powerful, and it kind of lined up with what I was talking about today. And so um, they were bombarded with this theme throughout this conference, and the people that were heading up the conference had different ways of communicating. Today, I've got one rock here, and in here, it was picked up by uh, Amy and my daughter and a few others, I'm not sure who, but there's 167 rocks in there. So that's a representation of one hour compared to the rest of the hours of the week. And what they would do at the conference, there would be one balloon and there'd be 167 balloons. 
or there was one ping pong and there was 167 ping pong balls, okay? Um, Jenga, there was one Jenga piece and 167 Jenga pieces. One Twinkie and 167 Twinkies. And they were doing that each session. They had that so that somebody would go, so what you're saying is one hour a week of church compared to 167 hours for the rest of the week. How is that playing out in teaching the values to my family about my walk with God? Now, some of you are going, oh, no, you're going, you're going to say you need to be in church, well, you know, however many. No. I mean, I think, I think we got some good things going here. But Sunday school, after this, I think it's a good thing. Um, grace groups, I think they're a good thing. Ladies Bible study, Awana, we could go through all the different opportunities and things where people are pouring in and talking about that. But it's also talking about, because we have to take out 8 times 7, 56, we got to take out 56, am I doing my math right? For sleep, okay, unless some of you are so amazing that you're learning Bible and stuff, you have it playing into your ear when you're sleeping and you're just osmosis, you're taking it all in, you can't get enough. Okay, probably isn't happening. You're sleeping, all right? But the rest of those hours, what are you and I doing? Are you having conversations with your young person, your child, your grandchild about God? Does it come up while you walk on the road, while you sit together? Because with all these other things, if I were to say to you, or you were to say to me, I want my son to be the best wide receiver that there ever was. And I said to you, why don't you just take one hour a week and instruct them on how to catch a football? But the rest of the time, you don't have to talk about it. You never watch it. You never um, have him go to camps. You know, and we could go down there. Or I'd like my child to be good at blank. One hour a week is all you need to do. One hour. And you're good. Most of us would go, well, that's stupid. One hour. You mean I can't? I'm not going to talk. No, don't talk. You don't need to talk about it. What, why would we not be surprised that he's actually a horrible wide receiver, or she can't sing a lick? I mean, you look at that girl. I don't know if you saw that one. America's Got Talent. She's doing ventriloquism with two puppets. She, that was one hour a week only. You know, she just picked it up like that. No. You know what that meant. And we are raising little disciples. Is that enough? Jesus says to his disciples, those that have been willing to give up houses and lands and all stuff, who won't be paid back a hundredfold? What are we investing? What are we all in on? When it all comes down to it. And what's so cool about this, God's so amazing that we can talk about him in the midst of this other stuff that we do in life. Those of you that are into cars, you can actually be a mechanic, work on your car, and talk about things of God while you're doing that. The rides in the van. The op a song comes up talking about things of God. He made it so that it's like we'd see things and it would point back to him. He does it. Are you willing to give more than just that? I would encourage you. I would invite you to be a part of a lot of the stuff that we got going on here. I really believe God's doing some stuff and it's all to his glory. Let's pray.